team. I just want you all to know we are a blessed church to have such an amazing worship team. Like, uh, y'all can clap for them. They do. We, we, we do miss Pastor Jason and Kelly. Uh, real quick, I just want to let you all, a lot of people are probably wondering, why are you on stage? And so real quick, I wanted to let you know, if you don't know who I am, I am Pastor Matt. I am the children's pastor. So if you see me kind of hyper and running all over the stage, it's because I normally preach to children. And <laughs> they wouldn't hire someone to preach to children unless he was a child, which don't, don't worry. Miss Lauren told me yesterday, I still call her Miss Lauren because I'm used to talking to kids. Lauren told me yesterday that I have to act like a grown-up. So we'll see how that goes. But Pastor Jason and Kelly, as a lot of people know, they went down to Louisiana because last week Pastor Jason lost his nephew. And he went. They, the funeral was in Louisiana, and it was on Friday. Well, Friday evening while they're in Louisiana, um, they were at Kelly's parents' house, and Kelly and her mom were in their elevator in the house. Her dad is in a wheelchair, so they have an elevator. And the cable to the elevator broke. And the elevator fell 10 feet with Kelly and her mom in the elevator. Um, Her mom had to have surgery on her ankles, and she has to have another one on Tuesday. And as of right now, Kelly has to wait to see an orthopedic doctor. Um, I believe it's tomorrow is when she'll see the doctor. So they are still in Louisiana. They have to get... Um, they have, Kelly has to basically follow up on her injuries at the doctor. So keep them in prayers. We're actually going to pray for them in just a moment. But Pastor Jason, I texted him last night. I said, is there anything you want me to tell the church? And he said, tell them. I said, thank you. He has felt your prayers. They are exhausted. They are worn out. They, there's so, if you won't hear me say these words a lot, but the enemy is attacking. <laughs> He is, he, Pastor Jason is our pastor, and he's doing an amazing job, and I am so happy to be under such an amazing pastor, and he is under an attack. The enemy is after him. You don't see things like this happen. It's obvious the enemy's attacking. So keep praying for our pastor, because God is, has something huge in store for him. And right now, they need our prayers. Because you know every time when God's going to do something great, the enemy attacks right before it. And so, if you will, let's pray with me. Let's pray for our pastor. Let's pray for, for, for Kelly, and let's pray for her mom and the whole family. Like I said, her dad is in a wheelchair, and so her mom is not going to be able to walk for a while because she had to have surgery on, on her ankles. And so they're actually going to stay down there this week, the whole week. Pastor Jason plans to be back next Sunday. But as of right now, they're staying down there through the week to help get everything lined up for her parents to get help in there since both of them won't be able to get around very well. So pray with me. Jesus, we pray right now for our pastor. God, we pray peace over him and his wife. God, we pray strength for them. I pray that you would touch Pastor Jason's heart, that you would touch his mind, that you would bring peace to him, you would bring comfort to him, you would bring strength to him. I pray for Kelly right now as she's dealing with these, these injuries. God, we pray that you would heal her body, that when she shows up to the orthopedic doctor tomorrow, that that they would not see any injuries. They would not see anything wrong. They would look at her and say, you should have been injured, but you're not. They'll look at her and say, there's something that should have happened to you, but didn't, that, you, that your body is whole. We pray healing over her body right now. We pray for Kelly's mom that as she's dealing with these surgeries, as she's having to go through them, I pray that you would bring healing to her body. That when she goes in Tuesday, they, they would say that there has been a drastic change and that, that your, your ankles are, are healing. I pray that at, when she goes in for surgery that you would guide the doctor, that you would help them to do everything that they need to do to get her back on her feet as quick as possible without any lasting injuries. God, we pray for our pastor. We pray for our pastors. We pray that you would touch them. You would give them peace. You would touch their kids, that you would give them strength as they deal with this because we know it's stressful and we know it's tiring. And we pray that their kids would be nothing but comforting to them. Jesus, we thank you. And I pray that you would would bring a word to Pastor Jason while he's there, that you would remind him how much you love him, how much you're looking out for him. And I pray that you would touch his family, bring blessings to them, Jesus, we thank you and we love you. In your name we pray. And everybody said with me, amen. So when I got the call about Pastor Jason on Friday, 
I, I immediately started, I went to the first place to see more details that everybody would go to find information. Facebook. I got on Facebook and I was like, all right, has anybody posted anything that I don't know? And so I'm sitting there scrolling, and right as I'm scrolling, I start seeing everybody talk about Muhammad Ali's death. And I keep seeing the word, the goat. And I saw it, and God started speaking something to me while I'm looking at this. And I'm like, that's interesting. And then I get a, call, I get a text message from Pastor Jason at about 1130 that night, and he says, hey, you're preaching Sunday. And I was like, all right, well, I have this thing already stirring inside of me. I'm gonna, I told Lauren about it. She's like, start writing stuff down. I was like, well, hold on. Hold on. Let's, let me pray. Let me see what God says. And tomorrow morning, if God is still stirring this in my spirit, we'll see where it goes. And I woke up, and all I could think was the goat. For those of you who don't know what the goat means, the goat is a sports term that means greatest of all time. Some people might argue who's the goat in every sport because everybody has their favorites. But there are people that I looked up online and I believe to be the specific goat of their specific sport. Now, I'm not talking about their lifestyle outside, their beliefs. I'm talking about them doing their sport. The first person, which is the person I saw on Facebook, Muhammad Ali. If you were a fan of boxing, you would agree Muhammad Ali was the greatest boxer to ever live. Now, then I'm going to get into some sports that people might argue. But first, I'm going to say another one that's obvious. Hockey, Wayne Gretzky. If you're a hockey fan, which I am, Wayne Gretzky, greatest there ever was. Here's when people might start throwing stuff. Basketball, Michael Jordan. I, I know I might lose some of the ladies in here for a second. I don't, Kobe fans, LeBron fans, I don't care what you say. Michael Jordan, greatest of all time. Keep your, don't throw any Bibles until we're done. Baseball, the babe, Babe Ruth, greatest of all time. And I'm going to finish with this one because I have a feeling I might, someone might get angry. Football, a lot of people are waiting on me to say Peyton Manning. A lot of people are waiting on it. Might be personal belief there, but I put, I, I put in my notes, Jerry Rice. If you're a fan of football, you know how great Jerry Rice was and everything he did. These people are the goats. They are the greatest of all time. They are the best in their sport. Some people might argue it, but if you look at stats, you'll see that they are. LeBron fans, be quiet. So, I wanted to talk to you about the opposite of goats. Something that you've probably heard from the pulpit a few times, the underdogs. You always look at the underdogs. They are the people who go in and they are supposed to lose. They might have been losing the whole time. They might have been constantly on the bottom of the charts. And then all of a sudden, they have a comeback. And they start doing great. And we've seen the movies. If you watch a movie today, it is an underdog movie. The entire market is flooded with underdogs. It's gotten to the point where all of us desire to have an underdog story. We want that comeback. We want to come from the bottom to the top. And there's people in the Bible that have been referred to as underdogs. And I want to talk to you about a couple of them real quick. Elijah. A lot of you know the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Carmel, Carmel, however you want to pronounce it. Carmel. He was on Mount Carmel. And it's him, the only prophet of God, lined up against 450 prophets of Baal. And Elijah was kind of a trash talker. That's what I liked about Elijah. He, he had no problem laying down some smack talk. And he says to the prophets of Baal, hey, why don't we put your God against my God and see who the true God is? And prophets of Baal were like, sure, let's, let's see what your God can do. So he's like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a bull. I want you to slaughter it. I want you to put it over there. I'll do the same thing over here. I'll let you go first. And what you're going to do is you're going to cry out to your God and, he's, and see if he'll send fire from heaven and consume your offering. So they do it. They're sitting there, ah, just crying out, however the prophets of Baal cried out. And Elijah's standing there. Your God's not doing anything. And he's like, maybe, maybe you should cry out louder. So they start screaming louder. They start breaking pots and cutting themselves. They start dancing and wailing. And Elijah goes, maybe your God's in the bathroom. And they're all over there cutting themselves and screaming. Elijah's standing there just smiling. He's like, all right, my turn. 
Before I start, though, I'm going to dig a trench around it. I want you to go get these jars of water, pour water on it. Now, side note, they were in a drought, and he made them pour water on it. That's another sermon for another time. But he made them pour water after water after water on the altar, soaked it. And he says, all right, God, show them you are God. And you're turning your hearts, their, their hearts back. He wasn't talking about the prophets. He's talking about the people who have been serving God, but now they're pretending they don't serve God. He said, show them your God and show them you're turning your hearts back to them. All of a sudden, fire from heaven. <laughs> consumed the sacrifice. Consumed the water. Consumed all of it. Now he's like, all right, see those prophets of Baal? Go get them. So they chased down the prophets, brought them down. He had all the prophets of Baal slaughtered. A lot of people will call him an underdog because it was one against 450. Another one, another person that's been referred to as an underdog. He's kind of a lesser known person in the Bible that some of y'all might have heard of. His name is David. And he was going against a guy named Goliath. Goliath, nine foot tall giant champion Philistine. He was the guy when the Philistines didn't feel like fighting. Like, hey, send out Goliath. Send Goliath out. And all the Philistines would sit back, like, all right, this is going to be easy. And they'd come out and say, send out your champion to fight our champion, and let's just settle it this way. And the Philistines obviously had never lost. And all of Israel was hiding. They were all scared. And David's like, I'll do it. I'll fight him. His brothers were like, what are you doing? Go home. The king, the king who should have been the person when no one else says, I'll fight him, should have said, no, I'll do it. I'm a foot taller than all of y'all. I'm the best option we have. I'll go fight him. That should have been the king, but it wasn't. And then David's like, hey, I'll do it. He's this little, ruddy, red-headed kid. And he's like, King Saul, let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. If y'all are parents, some of y'all might have kids. Like, come on, let me do it. Let me do it. And they just do that over and over and over to the point where we're like, fine, do it. Stick your finger in the light socket. Go for it. And that was the David situation. He's like, let me do it. And King Saul's like, fine, go fight him. No one else is going to do it. So David goes out there, and Goliath starts laughing at him. <laughs> You're so little. And um, David runs up, grabs him. He's got his rock, got his sling, starts slinging, drops him. Runs up, grabs his sword, takes his head off. David, who by our standards should not have won, he should have lost by our standards. But he ran out there anyways. And he took him out. Another person I really like, his name is Shama. Shama stood his ground in a bean field. He was with an army. They ran. Philistines were coming. This field represented their food, represented their income. That represented their livelihood. He knew if he ran, they had nothing to come back for. So he stood his ground, and he killed over 300 Philistines. Another guy named Jonathan. Jonathan was King Saul's son. And they were sitting there staring at an army of Philistines. Now, the Philistines had taken away all of Israel's blacksmiths. So there are only two swords among the entire Israelite army. King Saul and his son Jonathan had the swords. He looks over at his armor bearer. He's like, hey, come with me. We're going to sneak over to the enemy's camp. If you have a friend that does that and you're in battle, say, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Let's, let's stay here. We can at least see them coming. He's like, no, 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 come on, let's go. And his, his armor bearer says, you know what? Whatever you want to do, I'm right with you. If you have friends that do that, keep those friends. But they go over there, and they go between the mountains. I want to tell you the mountain names. I want to get them right. Bozes and Sinah. Everybody say Sinah. So they go over there, and he says to his armor bearer, if they tell us to climb up to them, that's God's sign we're going to climb up and beat them. And his armor bearer's like, okay, whatever you say. And he's, so they climb up, and the Philistines look down on him and says, Climb up here, you dogs. Let me teach you a lesson. And it, he looks at his armor. He's like, That's our sign. He's like, I don't think it is. But they climb up. And the Bible says that they took out over 20 men right there in that standing. These people have all been described as underdogs. I have a problem with that. I don't think any of them were underdogs. An underdog is defined as a person of less power who is expected to lose. Now, here's the thing. Just because everyone else expects you to lose does not mean we have less power. There's a guy I want to tell you about. 
I'm going to go back to sports, ladies. I apologize. There's a guy I want to tell you about. His name is Jack Haley. Jack Haley played in the NBA, and one season, the season of 95 to 96, he scored five points. If you think Jack Haley scoring five points had a chance at winning a championship, raise your hand. All right. Jack Haley, combined with his teammate, uh, a guy y'all might know by the name of Michael Jordan, scored 2,496 points that season. Now, Jack Haley, who thinks he was an underdog? None of us. You know why? Because his teammate is defined as the goat of that sport. He's the greatest of all time. And guess what? Today, Jack Haley has a championship ring because he was on the team with somebody who was not an underdog. We have power. You might feel like Jack Haley only able to score, score five points, but our team has power. Our God has power. David stepped out there and said, you know what? If it's just me, I can't beat this giant. But I serve a God who can. And I'm going to go out there, me and God, and we're going to take him down. David was not an underdog because of who he walked out on that field with. You might feel like an underdog sometimes. You might feel like a failure sometimes. You might feel like you're not good enough sometimes. But if you walk out onto that field, walk out into life with God, you're not an underdog. Everybody these days wants to be an underdog because of the movies we see, because of the things we see on TV. We all see the underdog story. But the problem with underdogs, it's normally the people who haven't been trying, the people who didn't really care, the guy who didn't go to the gym who shows up on the court and gets lucky and becomes an underdog, the guy who's been working in the gym constantly and constantly and constantly, he's the guy that becomes champion. And for some reason, today's world has trained us to hate champions. Today's world has trained us to look at the guy who's put in all the hard work and think, you know what, I want to watch him fail. I I love fighting sports. One of my favorite sports is UFC. There we go. I got an amen out of that one. That's awesome. So I love watching the five-round fights. Like a lot of people want to see a guy go in and knock somebody out first round. Five rounds, that's 25 minutes of fighting. I like watching the guy who's in the 25-minute fight, who's still standing, who's still fighting. You see the exhaustion. You can see that they're burnt out, but they're still standing there trying to win. Because, you know, that's the guy who put in all the time, who put in all the energy, and who's not willing to quit. We need Christians today who are willing to fight and fight and fight, go into overtime, go into extra rounds, do everything you can, do everything you have to until you win. The enemy wants us to quit. He doesn't want us, he wants us to lose, but he he knows he can't beat us. The enemy cannot beat you. You might say, but I don't have power. I'm pretty sure... Acts 1.8 says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. Could you throw James 1.12 on the screen? You already did. No, you didn't. Is it up there? There we go. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised those who love him. Now, anywhere in that, I'm 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 gonna ask you a question. Like I said, I'm used to kids' church. Feel free to respond. I like response. If you feel like I'm preaching too long or going too quick, respond to me and I'll slow down. So, does that scripture say, those that try get a participation award? You sure? All right. Nowhere in there, I I have not read the entire Bible in preparation for this message, but I'm pretty positive Nowhere in the Bible does it say you will receive a participation award. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get an award for just showing up and then leaving. We weren't made to lose. We were made to receive a victor's crown. We were made to compete and win. Now, here's the thing. Whether you are the Jack Haley or the Michael Jordan does not matter. The 96 Bulls won the championship. Last year, as some of y'all know, I kind of liked the Denver Broncos. Woo. 
I thought I'd get an amen, but it's okay. So I kind of like the Denver Broncos, and last year they won the Super Bowl. Did you know that when a team wins a Super Bowl, they get 150 Super Bowl rings to give away? There's only about 50-so guys on a team, give or take. So there's 100 rings that go to staff, go to employees. Did you know the janitor at the Denver Broncos Stadium got a ring? Because the guy who runs the team, some of you all might know who he is, we're going to move on. But the guy who runs the team says every single person who played a part in us winning this championship gets a ring. Whether you're Peyton Manning standing out there making plays, scoring touchdowns, no matter whether you make the MVP or not, if you are the guy cleaning the bathroom, you have played a part in our victory. There are people who are going to show up today who will hopefully their lives be, get changed. Whether you stood on stage in the worship team, whether in the sound booth, whether in the nursery, whether you cleaned the toilet this week, you have played a part in every single person whose life is changed in this building. If you pray for Pastor Jason, you are playing a part in lives being changed. We have so many people today who are participation award focused. They think, you know what? If I show up, I win. If I... If I call myself a Christian, I win. Now, here's the thing. In no way am I I saying you have to earn salvation. Jesus gives salvation freely. Freely. Nothing you can do can earn salvation. Now, he also said, it also says in the Bible that faith without works is dead. If you accept salvation and let that be it, I'm not saying you're not going to heaven. But I want a crown. I want a ring. I want to know that I stood there on the championship team and I did everything I can to make sure that team won. Jack Haley has a ring and he has to tell people he scored five points. He played two games, scored five points the entire season, and he has to tell people, yeah, all I did was score five points. He's still a champion. I, I asked uh, Jennifer to bring this up here for me today. If y'all, don't, if y'all were not here last week, She was showing this off with a lot of pride, letting everybody know she ran her first half marathon, which is 13.1 miles. Don't forget the point one. I know. If I showed up to that race, I would not have a medal. Because about a quarter mile into it, I'm going to find the table and be like, can I have a medal? And I'm just going to, like, be exhausted and lay down right there. And it's like, just lay the medal on me and pour water in my mouth. That would be me. And they would say, no, you don't get a medal. You didn't finish. Be like, but I competed. I showed up. No. Showing up means I, ran, I was there for the race. I can tell people I was there for the race. I could probably go and find somewhere to give me a sticker and put it on my car. But I'm not getting a medal. I'm not getting to go around with that pride that, that Jennifer had last week and say, look what I did. That's not what she did. But she was showing people, like people would walk up and look at it. She'd be like, look, I did it. She, I did it. And that's something to be proud of. Now, today, you might be in here and say, I've been trying to run. I've been trying to fight. And I am losing. I feel like I am on the ropes. I feel like I'm about to go down and I can't fight anymore. My question is, how much time are you spending in the gym? How much time are you spending in prayer? How much time are you spending reading your Bible? Muhammad Ali said, I hate training, but I want to be a champion. I hate training. For those of you all who don't know me very well, I hate reading. I, I struggle reading. I am very, my, I'm, I'm like a little kid. If I see a squirrel, I'm gone. And when I start reading, I'll read a page. And because I heard somebody talking in a room down the hall, I didn't read anything on that page. And by the time I get to the bottom, I'm like, I have to start over. <laughs> but I know that I have to read. I know that I have to take my Bible, I have to get myself away, and I have to focus on it, and I have to wait for God to speak to me. Because I know that the tests that come in this world, and they are coming. And let me tell you this, Satan is not going to take it easy on you. You have power to win. You do. 
Because your team has power to win. If you have God on your side, you have power to win. David had to have the courage, he had to have the boldness to run out on that field and throw the stone. But you know what David said about throwing the stone? He said, well, I killed the giant. I mean, I killed the bear. I killed the lion. He had preparation. The faithfulness that he had when he was in the field alone gave him the boldness, the strength to do what he had to do to step out on that field and allow God to work through him. Jonathan, when he was going through those cliff sides, Bozes and Sinna, as he's going through those mountainsides, and he looks up at the Philistines and they say, climb up to us. That is a 14 verse passage with a one verse that explains his victory. 14 verses for the journey, 14 verses for the work, one verse for the outcome. Now, Bozes and Sinna, I keep saying the name because I want to point something out to you. Bozes translates slippery. The fear of failure. That cliff represents the fear of failure. Sometimes it's hard to climb that because you know you're going to slip, you're going to mess up, you're going to fall, you're going to make mistakes. And it's, he could have got to it and said, I can't climb that. And then he looked at the other side. Sinna, which translates thorny. Now, we live in the south. A lot of us have ran through woods at some point, and a lot of us have grabbed onto a thorn bush at some point. It does not feel good. This cliff is described as thorny. Every time he went one grip higher, it hurt. Every time he reached his arm a little bit more, it was painful. But progress takes pain. We look at those stories and think, man, they just did it so easy because God moved. No, they had to work for it. Us as Christians are going to have to work for our victories. Whatever is happening in your life, whatever is going on, whatever you're praying about, whether it's sickness, whether it's pain, whether it's family, whatever is going on, it is going to hurt going through it. And sometimes We're going to be afraid we're going to fail. Boxers hate getting punched. They do. Boxers hate getting punched. But if their fear of getting punched was stronger than their desire for greatness, for championship, they would never step in the ring. They would never try. I... When I was, when I was uh, not a teenager, but a little over teenager, I wanted, to, I wanted to fight. I wanted to be a boxer. I wanted to do kickboxing. I wanted to do all that stuff. I thought it was awesome and fun. I don't like getting punched. So today I'm a preacher. <laughs> my desire to be a great fighter was not bigger than my fear of getting hit in the face. This, has, this hasn't been punched in a long time, and it still looks like this. So you don't, fighting, no. So we have to desire victory. Some of us become victims of our circumstances. Some of us let, allow the pain to be stronger than the desire for victory. Whatever you're praying about today, whatever is going on in your life, you want victory over it. We do. I hope you do. Some people sometimes allow their circumstances to win. Some people sometimes allow their circumstances to beat them because they're too scared of the fight. Jonathan had to climb those cliffs anyways. He had to deal with the slippery cliff that was the fear of failure. He had to. If he didn't, Israel would have lost. His family would have died. But he knew if I can make it up this cliff, if I can climb it, if I can deal with the pain, if I can allow myself to suffer just a little bit, that when I get to the top, when I get past the pain, that is where God has victory for me. Some of you, it might be painful or hard to admit what you're fighting. It might be difficult. But I'm going to encourage you today that in a few moments, I'm going to give you a chance to come to this altar. I'm going to give you a chance to get alone with God. And I want you to, if it's you that struggles admitting it, tell him, God, help me. Give me strength. I'm on the ropes. I'm about to go down. I'm about to lose this fight. I can't keep myself in it. 
if you are worn out from fighting, I want to tell you this. This altar, you'll find strength. At this altar, you'll find energy to keep going. If we're in a fight, this is your corner. This is where you're going to show up. This is where your team is going to gather around you and tell you, keep going. Keep fighting. Keep pushing. Even if you've quit already, get back in the fight. If you've given up already, get back in. If you feel like you don't have power, if you feel like you don't have what it takes, this is the spot where you need to be. Right here. This is where you need to get on your face and tell God, I need you. Maybe you've never accepted him in your life before. When you get up here, grab me. Make, get somebody's attention. Say, hey, I need Jesus in my life. This is the spot where you can get it. That power that you need, this is where it's going to be. Worship team, if you all want to go ahead and come, come up here. In just a moment, this altar is going to be open. And whatever fight you're in, no matter where, you, you might feel like you're at the beginning. You're in the first round. you got plenty of energy. But you might say, you know what? I want a little bit more. Get up here. If you feel like that you've got stuff under control right now and you and God are doing great and you're pushing forward and fighting, there's going to be people up here that are on your team that need your encouragement. Lay hands on them. Pray for them. We have God on our team. We can't lose. All you can do is win or quit. And so today, I'm challenging you. I'm asking you, if you feel like you're going to quit, if you're getting to the point where you feel like you're losing and you can't fight anymore and you're going to throw in the towel, I'm going to pray. And when I say amen, find a spot at this altar. Let God love on you. Let somebody else in this room love on you and pray for you. But when I say amen, find your spot at this altar. Jesus, we pray right now. I pray for every single person in this room that you would move over them, that you would touch them. If there's somebody in this room that feels like quitting, I pray that they would come to this altar and they would, they would find peace with you. They would find strength with you. If somebody's too afraid to come to this altar, I pray that you would give them the, the courage to be here. But more than any of that, I pray that today somebody's life will be changed. I pray that someone who's about to quit would turn back to you. I pray if somebody in here has already quit, they would turn back to you. And they would get back in this fight. And they would keep going and keep pushing until the end. Jesus, help me. Help us. We thank you. We love you. And we give you glory. In your name I pray. Amen. If you're in this room, that's you. If that spoke to you, if that's you that wants to be at this altar, come now. Don't wait on anybody else.
with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath of living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath of living water, such a marvelous mystery. Just where we are, just start to tell him how much you love him. Jesus, we love you. We adore you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. You're worthy. So worthy. So
So we're, we're going to get done a little bit earlier than normal. Now, when Pastor Jason's back next week, don't expect the same treatment. He'll probably make up this time that I'm giving him. But as you go today, as you leave, remember, whatever position you play, whatever you do, whatever it is that's going on in your life, we have God with us. If God is in you, you have power to win. We are not underdogs. We're champions. We have the greatness of God in us. He's empowered us to do, to do amazing things for his glory. And so as you leave today, be encouraged, knowing that whatever is going on, no matter how difficult it can get, because it can get very difficult, it can get very hard, you can't lose. You can only win or quit. So, with that said, I'm going to pray. And when I say amen, you are dismissed. And as you go, remember Pastor Jason and Kelly. Pray for them. Pray for their kids. Pray that their kids would give them a break because anyone with kids knows that it would be extra difficult for what's going on. And so just pray for that family. So Jesus, we thank you for this day and this time. We thank you that you have given us power. We thank you that you have already won the battle and you have given us victory. All we have to do is fight for you. Jesus, I pray that you would give us the strength we need. You would give us the energy we need. You would give us the power we need to go out and do mighty things for you. Do mighty things so that, like Elijah said, that people will know that you are God and you are turning their hearts back to you. Jesus, we thank you. We give you glory. And again, we pray for Pastor Jason and we pray for Kelly that you would bring peace and healing to that situation. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for this day. In your name I pray. And everybody said with me, amen. We do have church tonight still at 6 p.m. in here. I don't know who's preaching. Find out with me. Show up at 6 and find out. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming out today.